Yeah, Custom game stuff. engines yeah. and why they don't suck. Um, I'm still uh, not yeah. sure if they do or not. Uh, so time-wise, I'm going to uh, do this for 45 minutes, roughly, and then save the last 15 minutes for a Q&A. So first of all, hi, I'm Eric. Uh, I am the founder of Decemberborn Interactive, um, which I founded, I think, about five years ago or so. Um, we just released our first game, Cathedral, about a year ago. And we're about to release the same game on Nintendo Switch as well. Uh, I'm also a team lead and senior architect at Edument, which is uh, the company where, I, um, where I'm currently at and doing this webinar. Uh, I've been with Edument for about nine years. Uh, so I've been here since we were a fairly small company. All right. so. I tried to figure out a good way to uh, kind of summarize what I do at, do at Edument and at Decemberborn. And at Edument, I, the short answer is I help companies build scalable systems. Uh, the slightly longer answer is that I help them with scalable systems and with strategies for continued development. Uh, usually there's some kind of reasoning that well some some kind of reason that we get involved and usually there's a architecture issue that we need to work with um, so we do this either by coming in to an existing code base working with mitigating technical depth uh, or we simply design new systems from scratch so my everyday job is basically architectural stuff for the most part uh, so a common use case for us is kind of that one company has a central or important product that needs to be either replaced or restructured. Um, but um, they might also not be able to just shut it down because they will lose X amount of money per hour. Uh, so we need to have a strategy in place to replace parts of the system or hot swap it at the last minute or whatever. So that's kind of the typical use case. In December born, my role is a bit more clear. Uh, what I do at Decemberborn is simply that I make games. And when I, say, when I say that I make games, I make games together with other very talented people. So we're a couple of programmers. We work with uh, uh, graphical artists. We work with uh, musicians and so on. And we work with publishers and people who know more about marketing than I do. Uh, which doesn't say a lot because I don't know, don't know that much about marketing, to be honest. Uh, but yeah, basically, I make games. And I make games could loosely be translated to I make games, game engines, tooling, and other stuff. And I'm kind of here today to talk about those parts. So uh, the, we built our own game engine for our game. We built a bunch of tools, and we built a bunch of well, other stuff. So. Um, as I said, I make games, game engines, and other stuff. So I've made kind of an assumption about the. Uh, I made a, a, an assumption about the uh, uh, the people joining this webinar. So first of all, you're probably a developer, but even if you're not, don't worry. We won't be looking at that much code, but there will be some code. You might be the architect of a project or a company. Uh, you might also just be interested in architectural principles. And you might or might not do game development. You don't have to. And if you're here, you're probably curious in the subject. But uh, there's, no, there's no understanding that you need to be involved directly in game development. Um, also, a quick rem disclaimer here. Uh, first of all, we only have 45 minutes, roughly 40, I think, now. So we're really just scratched the surface of things. I, I had to cut a lot of stuff out that I kind of wanted to uh, wanted to talk about. Um, I'm not here to convince people to write their own game engines either, if that's what uh, if you're looking into writing your own game engine. Um, I'm not here to say that it's the only way to go. It's one way to go. And it's definitely something that you can do. Uh, but I might actually convince you not to. I'm not sure yet. 
Uh, I'm also not here to discourage people from not writing their own game engines. It's just basically what we did. So um, I'm just telling our story, what worked and what didn't work. The ag agenda for uh, my talk is pretty much to just give a quick glance of what I think software architecture is all about. Uh, a quick peek into uh, Cathedral, which is our game, and I look at the engine and the tooling around it, and some architectural principles, but from a game engine perspective, uh, followed by a Q&A of about 15 minutes. So, first of all, what does a software architect do? And this is by no means a um, any official definition. It's just that this is basically, based on what I do for a living, this is what, what I think of it as. Um, your definition might vary a bit. So first of all, I think of software architects as being responsible for the overall structure of projects, making decisions that affect that structure. Um, so basically what you do is you provide a framework for other people to work in. And I don't mean just selecting the uh, the correct uh, frameworks, such as which, which languages are we going to use, which uh, technologies are we going to use. Uh, that's also important, but it's not the only thing. It's also how do you test things? What are the boundaries of the software? Uh, how do you write your unit tests and uh, how does it all fit together? So basically the things that you have to decide relatively early on and that might be difficult to change later on. So being a software architect tend to deal with the things where you have to take decisions, which is somewhere between hard and impossible to switch out later on. So there's one more thing that I think of as being a software architecture when it comes to this. And it's not just the things that are between hard and impossible, because it's also that you will make decisions that turned out to be wrong. Uh, which happens every now and then. And there's also one part of figuring out a way to circumvent your own bad decisions. Uh, because every now and then you will actually make what will turn out to be the wrong decision, but you took the best decision you had from the information you had at the point, that point. So with that definition in mind, I figured we could take a look at the game engine and uh, uh, continue from there. So first of all, let me just show you the game. And this might be hopefully not too laggy, but uh, I have no idea how nice it will work to stream over Zoom. Let's see here. All right. So this is the game. It's basically a 2D game, a 2D Metroidvania, um, which for those who aren't uh, one second, let me just turn the sound off. So for those who aren't uh, familiar with the genre, this is uh, this is pretty much just a game about exploring. It's relatively non-linear, so you don't move just right from left or left from right. You uh, kind of have to backtrack and go through the entire world as well. And we built the engine together with... Uh, uh, together with all the tooling as well uh, from scratch. And um, you actually saw the editor quickly here, for instance. So this is the level editor. This one is actually built in Python. Uh, I think it took us about three weeks to build this editor. Uh, and it's just a way to easily place uh, uh, entities, which is basically everything you can interact with in the, with the world. So let's see here, these birds here, for instance, these are entities. So it's just, just a nice way to be able to quickly place things. So I don't know, let's place some, some birds, I guess. And our tools has been kind of, we've tried to focus on, well, uh, try to focus on being able to add content that matches our game as fast as possible, which is one of the pros of doing your own engine that you can optimize for the use cases you know that you have. Uh, so in this case, I could also, Let's see, let's remove those birds and let's just, I don't know, let's find this dog here, for instance. I thought, 
Uh, there we go. Um, so this is an entity. Entities are built by uh, basically um, connecting them to scripts. And we use a scripting language called Lua. So in this case, it's actually fairly easy for us to map things up. So I could, I don't know, I could go find a bird here, steal the bird script. See if I can find the dog again. Change out the script. And now we should have a dog that kind of, I don't know, pretends it's a bird and should fly away. Well, yeah, there we go. So we have a flying dog. Um, so Lua in itself is a dynamic language, which we um, decided to use because it's just so easy to add new content with it. Uh, and the pro of making your own engine is that you can kind of, as I said, you can optimize for use cases you have. And we knew that, well, we, we have our entities, we need them to support a certain set of features, and we need to be able to add them quickly and easily. And we need to be able to start the game directly from the editor and so on. Um, let's see here. So it is a 2D engine, but of course, as with many other games today that are actually 2D, uh, they're really not. They're kind of 2D, but for the most part, they're actually a 3D game projected from a different perspective. So it's literally a matter of perspective. Uh, you just have to kind of uh, set up an ortho orthogonal projection instead of a projective perspection, uh, perspective projection. So before I continue, some quick info. Um, the engine, we call that one Ganymede. It's, uh, I don't know, I, I have a thing about uh, giving my project's name, uh, names after Jupiter's moons. Uh, it's written in C++ for the most part. Um, we added a um, scripting backend on top of the engine so that we can uh, uh, write Lua scripts uh, for the actual game entities themselves. All the tools and the scripts that we're working with were originally written in Python and Bash. And that worked out fine because we only worked on Linux and we didn't really have a plan to release the game uh, as anything commercial back then. Which means that Python and Bash worked fine until we started setting up build servers for Windows and started to actually try and get the uh, game to build on Windows. Uh, so Python still in use, uh, Bash is still in use, but we kind of had to start a git bash uh, terminal on the build servers to get things running. Uh, so all our later tools have actually been written in Node and JavaScript uh, for the most part. Uh, Node and JavaScript has been very nice in the sense that we have the entire power behind NPM and uh, packages, and we don't really have to care about uh, mixing it into the engine because all we use our tools for is to produce binary output that we feed into the engine. So JavaScript as a uh, scripting language for tools is great. Uh, it's actually been really nice to work with, but it hasn't been, uh, it's not a part of the engine itself really. It's just it's rather a part of the tools. So all the entities that we saw were written in, uh, is, are written in either C++ or in Lua. Uh, and this is kind of a performance versus flexibility thing. So in C++, we, uh, I mean, when we write, if I would have written those birds that you saw in pure C++, it would have basically zero overhead. It would be, uh, I, I would almost not be able to measure the time it takes to create that instance, at least not in a meaningful way. Uh, the Lua instances are re re really, really nice to work with. Um, Lua as a scripting language is very nice in the sense that all of our scripts are basically small programs that just respond to events. I figured I could just show you quickly what one of our scripts look like. Uh, because let's, well, actually, let's just take the bird script, for instance, for the bird we just saw. Uh, we work a lot with uh, state machines. So the way we express things are by 
basically setting up like this, that we, we have a bird. It goes from start to an idle position. Uh, and from idle, we have various transi uh, tr uh, transitions. So if it gets the input fly, it will go to the flying state. If it gets the input walk, it will go to walking state and so on. And if we end up in the walking state, we can get an input fly and go back to the flying state and so on. Uh, so basically, um, we have kind of a framework in Lua that we built ourselves. We also have these kind of tiny stories, that we, storyboards that we call them, uh, where we can express things such as, um, and this is an asynchronous story, by the way. So we can express thing, uh, asynchronous things such as, well, let's start with a track fly and then do nothing for half a second and then send some input that we're done to the state machine and go to another state. Uh, so we kind of build up behavior by working with uh, storyboards, where, which is just a way that allows us to linearly describe what a state should be like, how something should actually um, behave, but it's not blocking the thread in any way, it's just purely descriptional. So for instance, this again here, track walk, then after that we randomize and if it's below 0 0.5, then we set a velocity x to minus one, 0 0.1, otherwise plus 0 0.1. And then we wait for a randomized amount of time and then we're done with this state. So all of these are just kind of easily described as a sequence of things that should happen. And then, uh, then they're asynchronously uh, uh, run after that. So, um, the Lua scripts themselves have, are basically, as I said, functions in, sorry, uh, programs in, this, in, in the uh, sense that all they actually need is a main and an update function. So, every entity has their own main function, it has their own update function, it's possible to send arguments uh, either we can hard code them or through the entity configurator, I can actually just add script inputs here and really just put this into uh, an argument and then that gets sent to this, to the dog.lua script as an input argument. Um, so it's fully possible to do that as well. Uh, the game runs on uh, Linux, Steam OS, uh, Steam OS, OS X, and Windows, and uh, we wrote it mostly in C++ 11 to uh, make sure that we actually uh, uh, could target all of those platforms. Uh, so it's been kind of feeling kind of an ancient the last couple of years where we've seen nice C++ 17 features and so on that we wanted to use but really haven't been able to. Uh, and since of last couple of weeks, basically, last couple of months, maybe, it also runs on Nintendo Switch. And we're actually doing the finishing touches right now. Uh, so currently, we're, I think yesterday, we uh, started testing the, what we believe to be kind of the final build. So uh, we're very close to finishing this one up as well. And I, I kind of felt like the game running on Nintendo Switch that deserved its own slide, more or less. Uh, and at this point, I realized that I haven't really defined what I mean by a game engine. Uh, because there's, and this is a fairly common question, uh, where the question is, what's a game and what's a game engine? Like, where do you draw the limits? And remember before how I said that, uh, I think that uh, your job as an architect is to provide a framework for other people to work in. Um, that's the way I think of a game engine as well. It's it's a framework. Uh, it's a framework where you can build games. And on one end of the spectrum, we have these really nice engines such as Unity and uh, Unreal Engine that does everything. Like you can literally build any type of game in them and they come with their own tooling and they come with everything you need. So it's very much a uh, framework where you have to pick the pieces that suit you because you're unlikely to use everything that engine has to offer. On the, on the other end of the spectrum, we have, uh, in, as in our case, we have our home-built engine where 
uh, everything is really to the point to what we need. And as soon as we start saying, well, it would be nice to be able to do this, that means we need to go in and actually modify and change the engine. So it's very much to the point. And it's really fast to produce things we know we need, but as soon as we need something new, we kind of have to modify things. So I figured I could show you the high level architecture of the engine and just talk a bit about how we structured things. Uh, and this is going to be very high level. I'm not going to watch too much code here uh, because, well, we, we would need more than 45 minutes. Um, first of all, we have a core library, which is the subsystem subtractions, basically. This is where we built in all the rendering, audio controller support, uh, both game controller and keyboard and so on. Uh, it has its own OpenGL renderer, uh, well, depending on the system, but right now we're doing OpenGL on all platforms. Um, the renderer is a batch renderer, so we basically batch up all the draw calls and draw one thing to screen at once, because everything is a quad, so it's fairly simple. Um, these are also the things that you kind of, these are simple in the sense that you know that you need to abstract these. You, you, that's why I, mean, I call them subsystem abstractions. You know that you, you will need something different on Nintendo, for instance, than you do on PC. Uh, you know that you will need to find uh, a different, uh, well, that you will have to write different code for controller support, for instance. Nintendo has their own API for Joy-Cons and so on. Um, PC versions, well, we use uh, GLFW there to uh, get support for X input. Uh, rendering, of course, every console has their own kind of rendering. So Xbox, of course, uses DirectX and so on. And uh, it's, all, it's all a matter of being able to identify the things that you know will change over time and trying to abstract them well. So that's, that's kind of what we're trying to do in this engine. And we, we kind of succeeded and kind of failed. The, these ones are obvious. So th those we actually succeeded with. Um, so those are success stories. We also have some failure stories, such as, uh, say, file system. Uh, I'll get to that later. But um, quick answer, uh, do not use boost in your uh, source code if you intend to port it to consoles. Um, Interactions is uh, basically where we, we oh, sorry, Ganymede is a library where we put all of the interactions. So this one is also a library. These are actually static libraries, by the way. Uh, so this is a library that makes use of the core library and adds event handling and scripting interfaces. And with script interface, I mean the Lua backend and all the entity de definitions and so on. So this is where we would implement all that stuff. Uh, so this is a highly event-driven engine. So for instance, in C++, let's see here, if we go to, um, actually, let me just grab here. Yeah, OK, so for instance, we have this subscribe to interface, which is very much just a publisher subscribe thing. Um, it has a handle function. Uh, which takes uh, an event, and that's it. So anything that needs to respond to an exit game event, we can just say, well, OK, uh, hook that up to listening to this event. And then we have a handle function where we handle and just take care of that event. Um, of course, this also means that we, we have some things that can actually happen quite rapidly, and the event loop needs to be very, very tight. So it's written in C++ and it's placed in this library and has just been very much a central part of, uh, of the engine. Uh, the same goes in Lua, actually. We have, um, let's see here, here's a typical event handler. We can actually for a specific entity, and this is the same mechanism, this is just exposed via Lua instead. Uh, we can hook up an event handler and say, well, on this message, which is just a string, um, respond to that and do something. So we have event handling in Lua scripts as well, uh, which is how we basically handle most of the game logic. 
So this is how we trigger things on the scripting side. So these two libraries make up the bulk of the engine. And then of course we have the actual game plus some tools which are being fed the data from the engine. So the game itself is actually a fairly light bootstrapper that takes all our binary resources and just sets everything up and sets the renderer up and uh, feeds the configuration to the engine and so on. But the engine itself takes care of most of the stuff. So for instance, uh, in this case, Cathedral would need a renderer, so it would set that up. But this tool right here, like the world map generator, would not need that, but it's going to use the same engine. So to show you what I mean, let me start the game again and show you the, oh, right. I still have a dog that is a bird. Um, so I'll just show you the map. Uh, so this is the map for the entire world. There are, I think there's about 700 rooms right now, actually. And uh, it's a map divided up into two layers. So there's a front and a back layer. And um, these are things that we do not want to sit and try and piece together manually. If I add a new room and hook it up to the world, I kind of want the world to just reflect that. So we, we built a... Um, tool that kind of just uses the engine and the game itself to get a starting position and then very much just traverse every room that it can reach from that point until it has built up the entire world. And then we generate map data from that. So basically we just figure out, okay, for each room we went to, how big is it and where in the world is it uh, in relation to other rooms? So it's basically zero work to add more rooms to the map. It just kind of happens based on how we built the world itself. Uh, but that's still an important part of the engine itself as well. So one thing I didn't mention, which I still think is extremely important, that was extremely important for us in order to be able to do this, is that we also have one binary with unit and integration tests. And we have quite a few tests, actually. Uh, we were two developers who built most of this, uh, at least the uh, actual code. So let, let me just run the unit tests. And by the way, if you're looking into writing unit tests in C++, um, CLion has a very nice test runner. So I think we have around 11 or 1,200 tests, maybe see here. Um, and these are written using TDD. So we've actually done a lot of test first development and where we've implemented test cases, see them fail, and then actually add the logic behind them to make them pass. Um, so we have, let's see, 1132 tests running here. And it checks everything from script integrations to uh, coordinate translations and, well, timers and so on. So I mean, timers in C++, uh, here are basically what the test would look like there. We also have tests on the, uh, on the Lua side of things. So I think, uh, let's see, I think I should be able to write. I have it here actually. Uh, not as many tests, um, 386 tests there. Uh, but that's because every script is so small. It's basically just um, behavior for that specific entity. And the things that we need to test in Lua is mostly things such as the storyboard and uh, the state machine and so on. So very much frameworky things. So for instance, we actually have a this is what the storyboard tests in Lua would look like, where we would say, well, in our storyboards, we should be able to, uh, let's see, uh, it's, for instance, it's possible to have conditional branches. It should be able to do that, uh, wait conditionally, and then select a branch that returns true. We have one unit test for that, and one for false, and so on. So a bunch of unit tests to uh, test all the 
all the stuff that actually makes up the infrastructure of the engine. Same thing with, uh, uh, let's see, state machines, FSM tests, there we go. So here we have a um, small unit test suite based on uh, churn styles, um, which is, by the way, the Wikipedia example of, uh, of a state machine. So a churn style, you know, the ones that you uh, can go into on, uh, see here, a picture says more than a thousand words, right? So these are churn styles. So th those are a really nice thing to express as a state machine because you have to kind of say, well, it can be in the states, whoops, locked, unlocked and disabled. Um, well, disabled is kind of, maybe maybe you can disable it, maybe not, but we decided to add it because we wanted another state, I think. Uh, but it could be locked and an input of type coin will unlock it. Um, and it could be unlocked and an input of type, uh, of type push would lock it again. So you kind of just jump between locked and unlocked. And this is what we used to kind of test the idea of, uh, of the finite state machines. And then we built most of our logic from that. So tests are extremely important in, uh, when you're building something of this scale, uh, especially when you're building something that you're going to uh, maintain under a long time. We didn't really split up unit versus integration tests. We're kind of mixed together, which you probably shouldn't do, but we haven't really had an issue with it, to be honest. So for all intents and purposes, this is the C++ code base. And we also made a resource pack and put that in its own repository. This is basically all the binary files, all the images and so on, and all the scripts that produce the binary files for the engine as well. So in our case, it's actually a Git repository. Let me find it. Um, and we generate things such as uh, this one here, which is our <laughs> texture sprite for the game. This is a texture atlas, which is very, very big. Uh, it's kind of fun to look at. So this actually, it's 8K, a texture of 8K, and it actually contains all the resources in the entire game, and there's still room to spare. So um, we actually only have one single texture in the game, and it contains everything. And it has actually worked out fairly well so far. Um, I think the main takeaway of this, though, is that we probably wouldn't have put things into different repos today uh, because that has actually been kind of a pain, um, especially when something goes wrong and trying to figure out where it went wrong and what repo. Uh, and we have several more repos than these. We also have repos from for the editor and for various tools. And today I would probably go with a mono repo, to be honest. Um, in any case, we have a deploy step where all the binaries from this resource pack gets copied over to the uh, to the engine output folder. And this is a good point to discuss portability since we actually started working towards uh, the switch release at one point. And the thing is that we uh, wrote the engine with portability in mind, but not from day one. Uh, from day one, this was, as, again, it was never really supposed to be a released game in that sense. So, and I never actually intended to sell it uh, back then, uh, five years ago. So portability came later. This is one of the few game engines that probably only ran on Linux and no other system um, because uh, we actually built it entirely on Linux. So porting to different PC platforms isn't too bad. Uh, it gives you an idea about the abstractions you need to make. And this goes for various software, not just games as well. Uh, you get an idea by getting more use cases about the abstractions you need to make. And with PC, it's fairly simple because you can, you quickly realize that, well, we need to handle file 
systems differently on OS X and on Linux and on Windows and so on. And we need to, uh, we might need to handle rendering differently. Uh, we don't actually, we just use the same framework for all of those. Um, Nintendo was at one point where we realized that we want to do this, but we don't really have any knowledge about the internal APIs or anything or the tools that exist because those are all under NDA. And um, we kind of needed to guess about what we should put behind reasonable walls and hide away and not. And we ran into, this is actually when we started porting, we ran into some of the, some really horrific performance issues. Uh, and basically due to bad guesses, but they were also kind of solvable due to good guesses. So I'm going to start the game one more time and just show you that when I, I know that it's kind of laggy on stream, but when I hit the edge of a screen, you can see here how it just kind of slides into the next screen, right? Um, and it kind of looks choppy right now on video, but in real life, it's very, very smooth. And the thing is, what we do here is actually, we never keep more than the room you're in, in memory. So every time we hit that screen, we actually read, parse, and load the entire level uh, on the same thread as soon as you hit that uh, edge, which means that we, we always have kind of a minimal state in memory. Uh, but the problem is also that that has to be really fast because people will notice fairly quickly if things happen, uh, well, well, if things are too slow. Like if you actually hit that screen and it takes a second, the game freezing a second every time you hit the edge of a screen would not be acceptable. So we had a goal of nothing should be over 250 milliseconds. And I think our slowest level on PC is around somewhere in the 50 to 75 millisecond range. And the funny thing is that when we got it started working on uh, Nintendo Switch, we actually ended up in kind of a problematic issue where it took, I think, 11 seconds from that we actually hit the corner of the edge until it actually had parsed the level and set everything up and, uh, well, went into the next level. So that was a horrific performance issue that we ran into. And there were a couple of those. and. Well, it turns out that you should not read files in the same way on a console that you do on PC. Um, we also realized the importance of automating things here. Uh, for, first of all, in-game tools, for instance. Um, in-game tools are one of those things that just... There's no substitute for having good in-game tools. So in our case, we actually have a help or, well, a cheat menu. This one is not in the released version, uh, where we can do things such as, um, say, uh, fill our ammo, fill our hearts. We can toggle God mode. Uh, we even have a progress system where we can kind of play the game up until a certain point. So I can say, well, I want to progress from the beginning of the game up to this point here and just sets everything up. You have the right army, you have the right uh, loadout, you have the right stuff with you. And the game has really been played up until that point. Uh, and this saves huge amounts of time, which is just ir irreplaceable. The same goes for things such as being able to do this, fly through walls, or even just holding down a button to quickly move around. So right now I can just kind of move freely in the entire world uh, in a matter of seconds. And if you have to run two minutes to get somewhere in the game, that's two minutes of real life time. And if you have to do it 10 times a day, then that's 20 minutes. And if you do that several years in a row, that, that builds up. So if you can just kind of find those things that you do very, very often and automate them away, that, that's just extremely nice. Uh, so the dev experience in general is also something that we kind of wanted to automate. And I notice I'm a bit behind schedule, so I hope you'll bear with me. I have, I think, about five minutes left. Um, the crash set me back. So I'll, I figured as a final 
part just to kind of highlight how important it has been for us to automate the correct things. I wanted to talk about the build chain architecture. Like how do we actually sit down, write code, get it out to our repository, from our repositories to say Steam and GOG and Nintendo. And this is very high level as well. I don't, I won't go into details, but in short, this is what it looks like from the server side of things. And this is fairly complex in terms of setup, but really easy in terms of use. So every time we work with something, we commit to our two repos. We add a new pull request. We open a new pull request on Bitbucket. Uh, we review each other's code. Code review is together with TDD, by the way. It's just, I, I can't stress enough how much I think you should be doing it. Um, and what we do is, is that we push and merge to master after a successful code review. Uh, Bitbucket triggers a webhook just as any other build system would. Um, this is kind of the common way to set up build systems and then it triggers a build server that builds everything and runs tests and so on. The problem here is that we have two different partners. We have GOG and we have uh, Steam, that's on PC. And then we have a partner on um, Nintendo as, uh, on the Nintendo build as well. We work with Elden Pixels as our publishers. So we need to be able to give people access to things in a good way. And what we ended up doing, because this is, um, this is a bit complex when we realize that, well, we need to build the game once for GOG on Linux and once for Steam on Linux, once for GOG on PC, or sorry, Windows. And well, for each platform, we need to build it twice. So we actually have four Jenkins servers running in parallel on different uh, operating systems. We have one Linux, one OS X, and two Windows machines. Uh, the Windows machine, uh, one of the Windows machines are running the Nintendo toolchain to be able to build that game. Uh, and in short, what they do is they all build different versions. So the Linux version, and the Linux build server will build GOG and Steam builds for Linux. Um, the Jenkins version will build GOG and Steam for OS X and so on. And then we have one Jenkins server that will produce a Nintendo binary as well. Hmm. And after this, what we do is we actually package this up into a build, uh, sorry, into a zip file. So after everything is finished building, they all get collected together, packaged up into nice zip files that conform to the uh, APIs that Steam and GOG expect them to. And then we basically just send them through the respective pipeline and they go live on beta branches on GOG and Steam. And for the Nintendo library, uh, sorry, Nintendo binary, uh, it just gets downloaded manually by our publisher and then tested or sent off for lot check, which is the process that we're going through right now, uh, of basically getting the game greenlit. Um, and the best part about that is we don't really have to worry too much about that. Uh, as soon as people can access and download the build, we're, we're good. So uh, that's the best part of having a publisher. So all of this looks kind of annoying when you look at it from a perspective of how much you have to set up in order to automate this. But then you realize that we push daily several times to our repositories. And that's kind of where we want to automate things, the things that we do all the time. So the UX for us as developers becomes writing code. We add a code review, we open a code review um, we review each other's code and merge it. If everything passes, things are live. I mean, literally, as soon as everything has passed and we've merged it to master, it's a matter of minutes before that has been uploaded to beta branches on Steam and GOG, and it has actually built the, uh, um, the binary for Nintendo. So this is on all uh, platforms, which means that as soon as we're done here, we can just grab a controller, start Steam, and try things out. So it's, it's actually very nice in that sense. And this is honestly one of the more important takeaways. So this is the final slide for me, just important realizations and takeaways. But 
our job as architects is to keep complexity down to some extent, but also to realize that complexity is necessary. And rather than just trying to eliminate complexity, a huge part of it is abstracting it away and hiding it from the people who are actually using the system. Because we as humans do not deal with complexity well. And if we can just take that complexity and hide it away, things become much, much easier. So a complex system does not mean that it's complex to use. And this goes for not just build chains, it goes for the game and tools and so in general as well. So in fact, the more you want to actually help your users and have a nice user experience, the higher the complexity of the underlying system usually is. And if that complexity leaks through, in a sense that you actually have to know about the internal system, then you have an architectural problem. And that's kind of where I usually come in and try to find those boundaries in software because boundaries are extremely important in software and I guess in life as well. <laughs> um, I have more stuff I would love to talk about, but my 45 minutes are up and and I figured if, if there are people left, which, which I'm hoping, uh, we could take uh, 10 to 15 minutes for some questions, if you have any. First question, are you able to reload stuff without restarting the game, scripting or even compile and continue? Uh, we don't have compile and continue, but we have reloading uh, of the... It, it's not hot reloading as such, but what we can do is basically uh, change scripts and so on, and then save it and reload the level. So we don't have to restart the uh, game itself, but uh, we have to reload the level. So we actually have a uh, command for that as well. Um, so that if we actually want to change something, uh, we can just type R in the... Uh, right, one second. Let me share my screen again. So th this is actually one of those things where we kind of iterate fast and we want to be able to um, change a script and then just reload the level and then we can just hit R in the console and it just reloads everything with the new files. Uh, it's good, but I actually, for a future engine, I would very much love to um, to have a, well, to have a real uh, hot swap, uh, hot reloading. That would be very nice. I saw that someone else who have written their own uh, game engine in C++ and SDL. Yeah, we, we used to, we were looking at SDL as well, and we, I, I don't know, we might end up using it for the next engine, actually. I haven't decided yet, but we were using uh, GLFW for this one, uh, which I think, my feeling is that you get a bit more in SDL, which I'd be very interested in. Uh, GLFW basically gives you OpenGL context creation and uh, uh, controller input, which is very nice. But um, but yeah, it's uh, it's a bit bare bones. Um, yes and no. Uh, I would be interested in porting it to Vulkan. Uh, the question is, are you interested in porting it to Vulkan? Uh, I would be interested in porting it to Vulkan to learn Vulkan better because I'm still not, I, I still don't feel all that confident in Vulkan. Um, uh, I, I can feel like I did, I remember when I started with OpenGL and it felt like everything was just black magic and uh, I somehow managed to uh, screw things up and just get a black screen all the time. That's kind of, kind of where I'm at with Vulkan right now. So I have some way to go. So I would like to port it for that reason. I think performance-wise, uh, we are at around 60 FPS right now uh, on uh, uh, on the Nintendo Switch uh, with occasional dips. I think that in docked mode, we don't have any uh, noticeable dips at all. Um, but for future engines, I would definitely want to consider Vulkan because OpenGL is kind of... Uh, I don't know, you, you can could kind of, I could kind of feel the uh, limitations of it on the Switch. So I think Vulkan would be a much nicer alternative. 
Um, depends on what you mean by gameplay elements. Uh, could you clarify? Thank you, Peter. Ah, yes. Um, yes, actually, in one sense, we did. And that, that was uh, um, interesting and actually a bit hard. I think we could improve that more. Um, but we actually uh, did it because the player, remember I, I talked about state machines earlier. And if I look at the, our player script, this is, uh, let's see, player states.lua. This is a huge state machine for, this is the biggest state machine we have in the game, uh, the player. Uh, we have quite a few transitions and quite a few states. Um, so this is this is still transition and states machines. Um, so imagine writing this as if statements, uh, still going through states. So we actually did a lot of unit tests for uh, these. Um, so I think we have holy, I, this was more than I remembered. Uh, let's see here, player states dot uh, I think there's a player tests of Lua. Yeah, exactly. So we actually have a bunch of tests that uh, it should set the correct animation when walking left. Uh, should set the correct animation when letting go of a controller. So we could kind of uh, mock that right now we're pressing the right button on the controller. And then this should happen. And this stub should be called with set track, for instance. Um, Let's see if we can find something that isn't just animations. Uh, yeah, exactly. So it should cut off the jump if releasing button. So if you release the button early, it should actually um, not continue jumping, but just cut off and you should fall instead. And uh, we just kind of set up everything and press the jump button and check the numbers and make sure that this is actually correct. So we, we have uh, quite a lot of tests around that, actually. Uh, let's see here. Uh, did you write your own physics engine? Yes, we did, and I, I kind of deeply regret it. Um, it, it, was, um, it. It was an interesting experience, but I would probably go with something like Box 2D for the next, uh, uh, for the next engine. Um, because every single weird bug that we had stemmed from the uh, physics engine. Uh, like we, we had the weirdest bugs where you would suddenly fly through a wall or end up on the wrong place on the screen and uh, stuff like that. <laughs> it was always, always, always the physics engine. Um, so it actually costs us a bit more time than I would like to admit. Um, you mentioned the game and the engine works on OS X. Are you worried about the deprecation of OpenGL on Mac? <sighs> well, in the long run, yes, but I would probably, I mean, th this is another good reason to start looking at Vulkan as well. Um, so probably not worried. I think there's quite some time before it's dead, but um, yeah, sadly, I, I'm, I, I don't know how much of a future there is for OpenGL right now. I am i don't dare to say. <laughs> um, do you do any testing of the rendering, i.e. pixel by pixel comparison, or is it just the logic? It is just the logic. Um, I'm, I'm interested in doing uh, some uh, pixel by pixel rendering comparisons as well, but I haven't figured out a good way to do it yet. Um, I'm, I'm still kind of, I, I want to find a model where it feels like I'm not um, building two rigid tests where, where I have to update a bunch of stuff every time we iterate on something in the game. Um, so actually, if you have any resources in the, uh, on it or any links or anything, I, I would gladly take them because I'm actually looking in the, into that kind of stuff right now. I've been thinking about uh, extending it to uh, maybe robot testing as well, at least. Uh, so maybe not pixel by pixel right now, but it would be nice to have a test where I can actually at least have something that runs run through the game and actually give some kind of result report back. Um, 
Yeah. Uh, oh, so yes, but did you write your own physics engine as well in your game then? I take it as if you did. Um, then you probably know the pains of it. Yeah, it's uh, it's fun and interesting, but it's uh, yeah. Uh, it comes to a certain point where you kind of feel like, yeah, I just kind of wish I would have used something different. Uh, we looked at bullets uh, as well, and we used that in, I used that in some 3D engines that I wrote before, but uh, uh, Box 2D right now seems to be the one that I'm looking, is the one that I'm looking the most at, that I think would be good. So if you want to get in touch me, with me or if you have any questions, uh, um, uh, that you figure out later on, by the way. Uh, I'll just uh, type my uh, email and yeah, let's do that. So you, you can reach me on Twitter and email as well if you um, want to ask me something after the seminar. Uh, let's see, if like a lot of systems in game engines are accessible than others. Yeah, um, writing good tools is hard. Um, I think uh, we we actually, I think we wrote three versions of our editor and you just kind of have to start with something and hope that it's, it's a good fit. Uh, I, I think that the first level editor and tools that we wrote were in .NET, for instance, and we, we did a lot of it in C Sharp. And then uh, we, actually came to a point where we uh, didn't really feel like it was a good fit. Uh, this was kind of to try and build something that, uh, well, this was in the early days of .NET Core as well. So we tried to uh, uh, make something that worked on all platforms and C Sharp was a really crappy choice for that. Um, so we ended up, uh, I think, rewriting it in Python uh, and we used, what is it called, WX widgets, uh, Python w, WX or something like that uh, for the uh, graphic or gra graphical interface. Uh, I think that just picks something that either, uh, either feeds directly from your engine. So in our case, in our new engine, we're actually building the editor as part of the engine itself in C++. Uh, the other approach that we took in with Cathedral would uh, would be to build a standalone editor that doesn't really use the engine as such, and then just I would put a premium on having something that's easily that easy easy to express things in, such as say JavaScript with an Electron app, or uh, maybe some other Python framework. Maybe I'm not sure how uh, Qt is in Python, for instance. Um, but find a graphical uh, well, a GUI library that is easy to use, so you don't have to spend too much time on that. Because that, that was actually one of the major annoying points for us, and that was finding a good GUI tool set that we could produce a good editor in. So we're using uh, Dear EM GUI in uh, our new uh, editor, actually, and doing it straight in C++. So not, not sure if that actually answered the question, but it's probably the best answer I have. <laughs> yeah, dear, dear EMG is, um, it's actually a, been very nice so far. Um, I can show you um, very quickly what I've been toying with because I actually have our new engine up here. Uh, and let's see here. Oops. Okay, maybe not. Uh, <laughs> seems like uh, the engine is actually crashing right right now. Um, I do think that. Hmm. One second. I I, I think I could get to this to work actually. Uh, See if that works. Otherwise, I'll just mm, 
let's see. Rebuilding, starting. Oh, yeah, okay. So th this is really, really, really early uh, in a new engine. And uh, we actually have an overlay with debug tools for uh, from Dear EMG. Um So we're still, this is just the demo, uh, but we wrote our own render backend for this. But the idea is that I want to kind of be able to have a lot of tools straight in the engine so we can just pop them up when we need to, because that's just such a such a nice experience to be able to do that. Oh yeah, it's uh, uh, the NX uh, part was actually we, we call I'm calling our new engine Next right now, so it, it's not NX as in the Nintendo part. So there is no Nintendo code, luckily, <laughs> not yet. Um, downside is that you have to recompile. Yes, but uh, hopefully, I mean, we we still will probably have something like Lua to uh, shove that into the engine and uh, have the tools respond to that, basically. I uh, haven't used Rust yet. I think that uh, Rust is an extremely interesting language. Um, I, won't, I, th I think the problem right now is that it would be difficult to uh, uh, use Rust to port to different consoles, for instance. Um, I haven't really played with it much, though. I kind of hope Rust will continue to grow because it's an extremely interesting language. Oh, the view, my view on tools for Linux. Um, yes, so um, I'm not sure. Can, can anyone ever learn Vim? M maybe that's just me who kind of still feel like I suck at it after all these years. Um, but yes, I use C Lion quite a lot. Uh, in general, I use a lot of IntelliJ uh, IDs, actually. We use uh, C Lion for, um, for the engine itself. And uh, then we use uh, just plain old IntelliJ IDEA for, with a Lua plugin for, um, um, for the script development. And when we wrote the editor, we actually used PyCharm. So I'm just kind of like, once you learned one of them, you're kind of hooked and then you just continue using them all. <laughs> um, but yeah, so I think that um, my view on tools for Linux is that uh, it, it's definitely better now than it used to be. Um, but for me, a large portion of that is actually IntelliJ tools. I mean, I, I do have quite a lot of them installed and I'm, um, maybe I'm a bit biased, but yeah. Uh, that has made quite a lot of difference for me because I, I remember that I basically got dragged back to Windows all the time due to Visual Studio back in the day because there just wasn't any reasonable al alternative. And uh, today I kind of feel like for me, C Lion is not only a reasonable alternative, but I actually prefer it over Visual Studio. So feel free to uh, shoot me questions on email or Twitter or whatever if you want to. Um, and uh, I think that if no one has any more questions, I will end the webinar there. So uh, many, many thanks for showing up. Goodbye.